Well, hey, listen, my name is Andrew. It's so good to be with you this morning. I'm the family life pastor here at Lake City Church. And I have the pleasure of closing out our discipleship statement this week. Over the last few weeks, we've been working through this discipleship statement. And the reason this is so important is because this has really been a defining marker of our staff this last year and really of the church as we begin to move forward. And so it's vital that we pay attention and recognize really what's happening with this. This isn't just a four-week series and then we move on to the next one. What we're unwrapping here really is part of what we believe God has called us to as a church. And so if you've missed any of the last few weeks, I would highly encourage you to take part in those. They're up online, they're on YouTube, and to understand, to listen to what is being unpacked here. Because this discipleship statement really is part of the lifeblood of Lake City Church moving forward. And so I'm gonna read it for you this morning as we begin to unpack the last little part. A disciple is a fully devoted follower of Jesus who is obedient to his truth, transformed by his spirit, and engaged on his mission. Over the last few weeks, Mitch has done a great job of unpacking these first parts. What does it mean to be fully devoted? What does it mean to be obedient, to be transformed? I really enjoyed last week, week's message as Mitch really unwrapped the transformation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, what sanctification looks like. And so this week, what we're doing is we're asking the question, okay, what now? How does God wanna use us now? If we're being obedient, if we're being transformed, what does that look like? You see, our lives are busy. There's a lot going on between work, between school, between family, between the hobbies, getting that perfect swing in. I don't know, I don't have one. So there's a lot going on in our lives and yet we end up in these moments, I think sometimes feeling like our faith is like a substitute in the rest of what's going on in our lives. And yet what I think we need to take hold of and what I'm gonna be talking about today is this mission that God has invited you into and how you can grab hold of it yourself. And so we're gonna unwrap engaged on his mission. We're gonna look and, at what the mission is and really what it means for us as a church here in Kootenai County, Lake City Church, to be engaged with that mission. And so we're gonna bring some clarity and hopefully uh, eliminate all confusion, all distractions from what we mean by the mission. I don't know if you're like me, but I am easily distracted. I resonate deeply with that dog from the movie Up. who's like squirrel, right? Like it's like, what's next? Here we go, what's going on? In fact, so much so in our household, I have been essentially banned from going grocery shopping. Now, that might seem trivial to you, but I actually kind of enjoy it. I put in the AirPods, rock some music, and I just you know, do my thing. The, the problem is, is that in the past when I've been sent with a list, I don't usually come back with just what's on the list. You know, I go to the grocery store and something catches my eye, squirrel, right? And I'm like buying some extra things, but, but that's not really the problem. Um, the problem is that when I get home and Jackie's looking through the items, there's often things that aren't what they're supposed to be. And, and, and for the most part, you know, it's like trivial things. It's like rather than 2% milk, I got whole milk or rather than like iced coffee, I got hot. You know, it's sometimes small things, but there was this one time, this is many, listen, this was many years ago, don't judge me for this. I, I got home with the groceries, I uh, unloaded them into the kitchen, I, I was walking into the room and, and Jackie goes, hey sweetie, I was like, yes honey. Um, sweetie, I asked you to get limes. And I was like, I did get limes, they're, they're with the fruits and vegetables in the bag. She goes, hey sweetie, could you come here? Yes honey. As I walk into the other room, she holds up a, a, a green item. It's circular, you know, kind of like a lime would be, spherical-ish. And I was like, yeah, it looks good. And she goes, this is an avocado. <laughs> now, naturally, I don't want to admit wrongdoing. And so I said, listen, sounds like we're having tacos tonight, right? If life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. If it gives you avocados, you make tacos. <laughs> and so over the course of time, I have been barred from essentially doing a lot of our grocery shopping. And we're in the process of that, I guess. But when you're given a mission, it's important to find clarity. Because otherwise, in the distractions and the chaos of life, we end up veering away from what we've truly been called to do. So let's take a look this morning at 
the mission. We're gonna be in Matthew 28. This is the first gospel in the New Testament. This is vital for us. The New Testament begins with four gospels. These are four guys writing about one guy, Jesus. And the importance of this is because at the beginning of time when we broke relationship with God, there was this constant divide and battle to be reunited with God and to the point where God had to send his son, Jesus, to die for our sins. And so the gospels present this hope in Jesus. And there's this moment where Jesus goes to the cross, he takes our sins, and he dies. And three days later, he rises again, proving once and for all he is God. But at the end of these gospels, there's these final moments where he's with his followers, his disciples, and he shares some parting words, he shares some parting wisdom. And at the end of Matthew, at the very end of Matthew, what he writes is this commission that he's given to his followers. Now, if you've been in the church for any amount of time, you probably are familiar with the Great Commission. And that's where we're gonna be this morning as Jesus really imparts this mission on those who are following him because he knows it's time for him to go and for them to really begin the church. So if you have your Bibles open, it's also gonna be up on the screen. We're gonna be in Matthew 28, and we're gonna start in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I find that so intriguing. Can you imagine following someone? They die, they come back to life, and you're still like, I don't know. (laughs) For me, I think what this means is that for those of us that still doubt, take heart. There were people present that knew Jesus had died and come back from the dead and still doubted. So whatever your doubt is, it's good. Jesus has got you. Listen, In verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. This is it. This is Jesus commissioning his followers, giving them a purpose and a mission to take forward. Right there you see it in verse 19. Go, make disciples. I love how it begins right before that because this isn't just some man-made mission. This isn't just something that we've decided and thought, hey, this would be good to do. This is something ordained by God. Jesus actually says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so this is a God-given mission to his followers till the end of the age. Essentially what that means is until Jesus decides to return, the mission stays the same. Go make disciples. In fact, something that stood out to me this week as I was looking through this and I was reading some of it in the Greek, I I was leaning into this word go. You see something that's kind of interesting, it it, it translates in the Greek to mean actually um, as you go or on your way. In fact, there's this like nonchalant feeling I think, in regards to it. When I was growing up in the church, I often heard this in regards to mission. So anytime we'd have a missionary come in, this would be their go-to verse, like, go make disciples in all the world of all nations. And it does mean that too. But I love how it phrases it in the Greek when it says, as you go on your way. So listen, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you go to the doctor, as you go to the grocery store, as you go run your errands, or as you go golfing, on your way, make disciples. You see, there's an element to this that this is inherently a part of just who we are now. And so as we understand the mission with full clarity that there's, there's no two ways about it, we are called to make disciples, we have to recognize this invitation in our lives. It's not just something 2,000 years ago that was said to a small group of people, but it is something that has been continued on for centuries And the only reason the church still stands today is because every generation took this mission personally. And I think one of the greatest dangers in the church throughout every generation is when we lose the ability to personalize the mission that Jesus has given us. Recognize you've been invited into this mission. Growing up, my dad, um, well, he still does. It's not, didn't change. He loves baseball. And um, uh, he had hoped that that same love of the game would be passed on to his son. In short, it wasn't. 
Um, it's not that I dislike baseball. It's just that I'm not good at it, like at all. Now, the thing about baseball is that it starts out with T-ball, right? The ball's on the thing, and you can breeze through T-ball without any problems. I was doing good. And then I went to coach pitch, and it was getting a little tougher. And by the time we got to Little League, um, something happened. The, they start, like, keeping track of the stats for the kids. And so the coaches feel like they should start winning the games. And when a coach feels like they need to win the games, there's a section of players that don't play anymore. That's the section that I was in. And there were four of us on the bench, and we had the last numbers like on the roster. So it was like 16, 17, 18, 19. And we just, man, we sat on the bench all season long. And we were bored out of our minds, obviously. So we started like making jokes about it. And then every once in a while, like one of us would go, like someone got hit by a ball. And it's like, Johnny, you're up. And all of a sudden the other three of us are like, let's go. Like, we're like so excited Johnny's out there, but like nothing really happens. And I was thinking after that season, luckily my parents uh, let me stop playing baseball, but I was thinking like, why would I ever join a team or join this game if I can't play? That's what was going on in my head. And yet I think sometimes in the church, in Christianity today, we've adopted this feeling of contentment that we're okay with it being a spectator sport. That we're okay sitting over here because we're gonna let the other people play because I think God's doing something really cool and I'm excited to watch. I'm excited to be you know, kind of a part of Lake City Church, but when it comes time to serve, I'm really excited for the highlight video. You know, I think God's doing something really cool with the kids and the teenagers, but when camp starts, I'm gonna wait for the highlight video on Sunday. And I think what tends to happen is we've become apathetic and we've disassociated ourselves with the fact that there has been a personal invitation with this mission. That this mission is for each of us. Nobody gets to step back and not engage. In fact, so much so that when you received salvation, you also received the call to make disciples. And I believe wholeheartedly the healthiest Lake City Church will be is when each of us can personalize this mission. When you can recognize that this calling on your life, that this pursuit and this passion that has been set in place is from God himself and it is for you specifically. And then we come together as his church. Recognize, recognize that this is for you. And I understand the difficulty here. I understand that even when we understand the mission and we understand that Jesus wants us to partake in the mission, there's this lingering feeling that I'm just not quite good enough. Believe me, when I played baseball, I was not good enough. And so this tends to like well up within us and say, well, I I, I don't know how to say the right things. I haven't experienced enough. I haven't been to the camps and the retreats and I haven't been to the theology classes and I haven't been to the New to Lake City class. And so I just, I just don't have what it takes. You need to recognize that is a lie from Satan. Satan's entire goal is for you to be comfortable and to think there's a bench for you to sit on, that you're on B team, but there is no B team. Paul says in the New Testament, he says, we're all part of the body, we're hands and feet, where Christ is the head, and we all play a role. Recognize that you have been invited into this mission. But I understand and I can resonate with that feeling. There's a feeling sometimes that we can't make disciples because we're not quite sure if we ourselves are disciples. We look internally and we still struggle. There's still this feeling that we're overwhelmed by the things of life. There's anxiety and there's depression and there's addictions and there's all these things. And we end up in this place thinking, how could I ever go and make disciples when I can't even be a disciple myself? Please hear me and hear me clearly. You are not inviting people to become more like you. You are inviting them to become like Jesus. You will never be good enough. I'm never gonna be good enough. And that's okay because we're not inviting others to become like us. We're inviting people to become like Jesus. Jesus is good enough. And so when we are dealing with all of our insecurities and and our mess, 
we can still take hold of this mission and recognize we've been called to make disciples because they're not gonna be like us. My mess is my mess and Jesus is gonna help me with it. And your mess is your mess and Jesus can help you with that too. And so we invite them in, not to be our disciples, but to become disciples of Jesus. And I think when we can recognize that, we can begin to take heart and personalize this mission. Realize we don't have to have it all together. We never will have it all together. And that's okay. Because no one is gonna become like us. Become like Jesus and work towards that. So we understand the mission. We can take hold of the mission. We are called to make disciples and nobody's left out. We are all called to personalize this mission and move forward with it. But what does it look like to engage on this mission? Here's the deal. The world's changed in the last 2,000 years. There's a lot that has adjusted, moved forward, and, and it can be difficult because it's like, man, what would Jesus really do with Facebook and everything else that's going on? And so we recognize that we are following a mission that doesn't change. Throughout 2,000 years, the mission's the same. And yet how we engage with the mission changes. Culture changes, language changes, context changes, our lives, our jobs, our families, there's constant change. And so engagement looks different in every environment. Can you imagine if we tried to throw a summer camp for the adults like we do with the teenagers? We'd all be like, can we just take a nap? Like. <laughs> Is that okay? Can we do that? Those kids go hard. I was there Tuesday. It was raining. I saw it raining. And I don't think any of the kids knew it was raining. It's a, it's a different environment. We need to recognize that how we engage can change. And so what we've done as a staff here at Lake City Church and, and what we wanna bring you in on is our pathway for discipleship. We've identified four characteristics that we feel are placed and important in the mission of discipleship. And, and here's how I see these and how I value them. There's often times where I feel I'm stuck. Like I'm, I'm in relationship with others and, and I want to be a disciple who's discipling others. But um, if I were to pause and reflect, I feel like I'm not moving forward like I should. And so what these are is they're four pieces that you can kind of look at and evaluate and think, okay, I'm doing this and this is what I should be doing next. It's gonna be on your pamphlet it's up, also gonna be up on the screen. This is our pathway for discipleship. It is to discover, invite, grow, and multiply. To discover, invite, grow, multiply. Discover. Discover is to identify somebody in your circle of influence. Again, pointing back, Jesus said, go along your way as you go whether you're at work, whether you're at home, whether you're at school, whether every environment you're into, you have an opportunity to discover somebody within your circle of influence. Here's something you have to recognize. As you personalize the mission and recognize that your circle of influence is your circle of influence. I know, that sounds dumb to say twice. Here's the thing, it's not my circle of influence. That's why you're on the team and you've got the mission to make disciples because the people that you can influence are different than the people that I can influence and the person next to you can influence. That's why we're all on this mission together. The people you're gonna have conversations with are people I could never have conversations with. And so to discover, to be honest, spend time in prayer and to recognize that God is calling you into this mission to make disciples. And so what does it look like to take some time to prayerfully consider, to look around your circle of influence and identify somebody that you can begin to disciple? You are a hope. Jesus says to his followers in five, Matthew 5, 14, you are a light to the world, a city that cannot be hidden. That's what you are in your environments. And so the first one's discover. Identify somebody in your circle of influence. The next one is to invite. Invite them into the spiritual space of your life. This can look like multiple different things. This can be just conversations you're having. This can be actually inviting people into your home. Acts 2.42, when the church began and exploded, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. It says they met together daily in their homes and in the temple. That's big gatherings, small gatherings. They got together. It's difficult. There is a challenge when it comes to inviting those outside into our lives because what it means is we're vulnerable. What it means is that they're gonna realize we're not perfect. 
There's a book that came out like 10, 15 years ago by David Kinnaman. He's the CEO for Barna, which is a religious statistic institute that uh, analyzes different things going on. This book's called Unchristian. And what it looked to do was to ask those outside of the church and to gain their perspectives of those inside the church. Two of the top um, comments from those outside of the church of their perception of those in the church were to be judgmental and hypocritical. 87% said that they viewed those in the church as judgmental and 85% viewed them as hypocritical. You see, I think one of the difficulties that we have when we engage with those outside of the church is we forget to invite them into our lives and let them actually see that we know we're not perfect. That there's a reason we need Jesus. And I think if we're willing to listen, to let our guard down and to invite others into that spiritual space, I think less of them will perceive us in the way that they have. The third one's this, to grow, to move toward spiritual health and maturity. Proverbs 13, 20 says, those that walk with the wise grow wise, but a companion of fools suffers falling. I use that a lot in our house because we're raising three boys and uh, foolishness is abundant. And so, I try to remind them, hey, walk with the wise and grow wise. This idea that we invite others in and we begin to grow together. Wayne Cordero, who's a pastor and author in uh, Hawaii, says this, I love it. You can teach what you know, but ultimately you are going to reproduce who you are. This idea that we are called to grow together. Life group, open today to sign up. Join a life group. Get connected with people in this idea that we are called to make disciples. We cannot lose sight that we are called to grow and not just encourage others to grow, but to grow alongside others. Kara Powell wrote a book called Growing With and it's a parenting book, but it, the core part of it is talking about how as parents, we need to continually grow as our kids are growing and grow alongside of them. In fact, this week I had a difficult moment with one of my kids and there was a, uh, a lack of patience being exhibited in our household. So much so that there were things said and, and items thrown uh, that led to a point where I went home and I, and I grabbed him and I said, all right, bud, let's go. And so we went and grabbed coffee and then we were sitting and talking and trying, trying to kind of like work through what had happened, why it had happened. And I just felt this kind of like prompting in my spirit as I began to share with him this idea that, listen, but I, you know, I really think that this characteristic of being impatient is something that, you know, I see that I struggle with sometimes too. And as I talked with him, I shared a story of a few weeks ago when I lost my patience and I raised my voice at him. And I was like, do you remember when I did that and I had to come apologize to you later? He's like, yeah. And I said, you know what I think we should do? I think you and I both should be praying for patience. I think we both need that. And I was like, would you be willing to pray with me? And you could see like this like kind of softness in his eyes as he realized that he wasn't in this alone. And it was a moment for me that I was like, man, how often do I feel like maybe I'm growing on my own and then when I'm with others or even with, when I'm with my own kids, I'm like, okay, you need to work on this. You need to work on this. But rather when it comes to this mission of making disciples, we are called to grow alongside others to recognize that we are to move towards spiritual health and maturity together. The last one's this, to multiply, to multiply. Encourage and empower them to go and do the same. We're here 2,000 years later because the mission was personalized and individuals began to disciple others. May we do the same. May we read the great commission from Jesus and recognize that each of us has also been called to go and make disciples, to discover those in our sphere of influence, to invite them into the spiritual spaces of our lives, to grow together and then realize when it's time to encourage them to go and do the same. I believe wholeheartedly Not only will the heart of our church change, but the heart of our county will change. 
we will see this in the faces and the lives of those around us. We will see it in the next generation as these kids and these teenagers are growing up in a hopeless world. There will be a hope present in their lives that can only be recognized as the hope of Jesus.